Hi, good evening, and welcome to uh, another edition of the Tom Murphy Show. This is uh, February 18th when we're taping, and on the show tonight we have a longtime friend of the show, county legislator, my friend Catherine Parker. Catherine, thank you for joining me tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's nice to be back. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, you know, we are in the midst of a winter where the January was the warmest January ever. Uh, we are in a February where I, I don't, you, know, you can count on the fingers of one hand how many times it's gone below freezing. Right. Uh, and this has been, and, and the, the preceding warm Januaries have all been in the past decade. So, you know, welcome to climate change. Welcome to climate change. You know, change. this is just uh, a reality where now we get 65 degree days in Antarctica in January. Right. Never have seen that before. And uh, it's pretty frightening. Climate change is moving faster than yeah. scientists had predicted even five years ago. Yes. And uh, on the federal level, we're doing nothing about it. Actually, we're going backwards we're going is what backwards, we're doing. Right. Um, in fact, just today uh, I was reading about some of the rollbacks that the EPA is going to be making um, related to uh, coal production. So allowing for more coal production, which uses mercury mm -hmm. um, during that process, uh, that was one of the things that during the Obama administration, the restrictions on mercury really gave um, power plants uh, an opportunity to either change to renewable energy or, or, gas. or yeah. gas. And now, um, because of what the, this current administration is doing with the rollbacks, it really opens the door. And the interesting thing, and different than before, is guess who's complaining about the EPA rollbacks? The industry themselves. The industry is saying, we don't need the rollbacks. We, we know the direction that we need to be going. And, um, and and it's it's just really shocking that uh, this is how Washington is acting in the face of climate change. And you know what's interesting too, and it, you know, for people who pride themselves uh, on being capitalists, you know, the market forces have been moving away from coal. Absolutely. I just met recently with uh, the head of global sustainability for Citibank, just to hear what you know one of the most major banks in the world is seeing from their clients and. You know how they define risk management for their clients? Governments that are not acting in the face of climate change. Right. And they really see that the private sector is starting to step in and do what governments haven't been able to do. And so they are helping to invest in that. And, and you know what's scary too? The military, uh, the United States military, was always out in front of us. They recognized climate change, that they had contingencies for climate change. They thought about you know, what could be uh, world situations that might impact uh, you know, them in climate change. And this administration has told them to ramp that back. Yeah, it, you're exactly right. So the military, which we often think of as not being um, progressive, sort of progressive yeah. they have been sounding the alarm. Yes, because they deal with realities. That, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, they want to see stability worldwide, yep. stable governments. And one of the things that climate change is creating is um, migration. You know, right. people, there's drought and starvation and more people need to be moved from areas that are flooding because of sea level rise. Right. And all of that creates an instability throughout the world. And that's where our military is seeing that for us to be positioned well, um, we need to be, again, helping other countries and ourselves moving in the direction of uh, stemming climate change. Now, what, I know the county's been working on this. What, is the, what initiatives has the county uh, enacted to try and do our part? Yeah, so the, uh, Westchester County has really been take, taking the lead. And I give our county executive, George Latimer, an awful lot of credit. Um, he brought on Peter McCart, who right. was one of the founders of Sustainable Westchester, to be, uh, well, the position that I created for Westchester County, the energy director right. and the head of the Office of Sustainability. So Peter uh, McCart has been working for the last uh, two years, really um, helping to push Westchester forward. So just recently, they have announced plans for electric vehicle charging stations at all our municipal lots uh, in Westchester County or lots that Westchester County helps fund. Mm -hmm. So um, there are some uh, developments. I'll just give you one, for instance. 
in New Rochelle, we're working with a developer to build a family court to replace the old right. family court. So that new uh, that new building will have EV charging stations because they're receiving some finance from us. Now, the village put in two EV charging stations uh, in the bottom of Hunter lot, and we're looking to put two more in in another area because you know it, it, if, if you if you give people the opportunity to use these vehicles uh, more efficiently. Yeah. It, you know, it, it'll create you know, more of a demand. That's right, and and I can say is uh, I'm on my, my second Chevy Volt that oh, really? uh, I love my car, it's great. Uh, I think of it as an EV with, with training wheels because it, <laughs> it drives 60 miles on a pure um, electric charge. Right. And 60 miles, you know, for most days, that gets me to where I need to go. Right. And then I just literally plug it into a regular outlet that, uh, you know, we have outside okay. um, our garage. And, really? You so you know, don't need a, a 220? Outlet or nope, really? nope, and it's great. And I think more and more people are really finding. Um, I mean, I, I fill up my car once a month. You know, wow. it's it's really pretty great. And uh, you know, the, the the money that I save on gas, mm -hmm. uh, the carbon footprint, you know, carbon mm -hmm. emissions, it's it's phenomenal. Now, one of the things I, I know you care about and I care about also is uh, the county uh, maintaining playland as a public park. Yeah. Where are we with this right now? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked me that, but I understand <laughs> why you did. Uh, so, so, you know. I understand is, there's, there's litigation there too. There is so litigation, I, I, and, uh, but I, I will say this. Uh, last summer was a wonderful summer at Playland. Yes, it was. Uh, we had a new ride that, uh, the, the Dragonator, and uh, more people were coming to Playland than, than we had seen in a number of, of years. Uh, we also had great weather, and mm -hmm. that nobody can take credit for. You know, that yeah. was just, just pure luck. The situation that we have with a uh, private entity to manage our park has, you know, unfortunately gone the way um, into the courts. Um, we have uh, felt that they were in breach of our management agreement and uh, sort of at the last moment when the county had looked to terminate the agreement, they went to bankruptcy court. And this bankruptcy judge really w believes that um, bankruptcy should be avoided at all costs and would like the county and standard amusements to go back and try to negotiate and somehow find, find a way through. Okay. So it's still in uh, limbo litigation time, right? It is. Okay, I understand that. Uh, in a local level, and I've been trying to do this on a local level, uh, but I know the county has been working on this under this administration and uh, the Democratic Board more aggressively is providing more affordable housing yeah. for our residents. There's been an affordable housing study? Yes, and guess how many units of affordable housing Westchester County needs. I, I saw the number one time, I can't remember, 9,000? Over 11,000. Over 11,000. It is right. a lot of, of units. And that, that really goes to show a couple of things. You know, you ask the question, how is it that so many people are having such a hard time living and staying in Westchester? And, and I think there, it's a confluence of a few few things. One, I see the number of, though we have very low um, employment, unemployment, unemployment. <clears throat> very low unemployment, the number of low paying jobs that have been created since 1990 um, is significantly higher. Mm -hmm. So no longer when, you know, people are uh, out of school and starting to work, are they necessarily guaranteed that they're going to get a job that will allow them to sustain, rent an apartment. Sure. Uh, yeah, rent an apartment. And in fact, the, the study that was just done really showed that about 50% of Westchester residents are spending more than 30% of their income on their housing. And that's, that's a tremendous number. It is. The other, uh, aspect that I think is is significant to the study is um, Westchester has a growing population over 65 
And even when you look at the numbers of the people in their 80s and 90s in Westchester, that too has really been growing. So you have uh, people that have been out of the workforce for a number of years, even decades, that are just finding it harder to maintain mm -hmm. you know, everything else that goes into staying in place. So my thought is affordable housing, I think, is wonderful for all communities in that it allows for a diverse population and really helps people stay in Westchester. And uh, I've, you know, one of my jobs, I think, as a county legislator is just to go out and uh, educate uh, my constituents mm -hmm. and, and talk about it in terms of it's not, I think people get confused with affordable housing with public versus, housing. versus yeah. public housing. They are very different entities and um, public housing is, is, we need more of that too. Yes. But the number, and again, just really concentrating on the idea for affordability and talking about these two parts of our, um, of our population, people starting off in their careers mm -hmm. where this would, should be uh, a bright spot. We live so close to Manhattan. This should be a, a very attractive for people to stay in Westchester. Um, that is an area that I think we, we can be really doing more with, um, affordable housing. And then for seniors, I really think for senior citizens to, uh, to build more mm -hmm. housing. I know in my community in Rye, we did, when I was on the Rye City Council, we started with a project. We, it was actually passed and finished uh, when I was a county legislator and we built about 50 units of senior citizen affordable housing. And I, I knew some of the people that actually moved into that. Right. They had lived in, in their, you know, in a house, a traditional house in Rye, where they were really struggling to make ends meet. Sure. I knew one woman who had worked um, as a nanny for a family when the kids, you know, were, uh, were older. Uh, she ended up in an, uh, in an apartment over a garage and really struggling to to, to have a decent quality of life. And so that affordable housing project really helped. helped. Yeah, it's good when you're an elected official and you can actually see the impact of yes. stuff that you did on people's lives in a day-to-day -day situation. But you know, the, the whole thing with people spending 40, 50% of their income in rent, that means that they have no reserve. Right. They lose a paycheck, they get sick, and they face homelessness. And I, I think that what's changed over the last 30 years is how many people are on the brink of, who work, who've worked hard all their lives, are on the brink of homelessness, a couple of paychecks short of being homeless. Tom, I think you're exactly right. Yeah. I see that too. I think there are more people that are, as you say, just a paycheck or two away. And, and one of the things about government that you hope is that it provides a social safety net. Yes. And one of the things that we see in government, and I'm sure you see this as, as mayor of the village of Mimaranek, is that if you can do something today that, you know, costs this much, mm -hmm. that can save somebody from needing a multiplier of that number down the road, road. when they're in a worse situation, right. I think that's where government can really step in and make all the difference. What's the old saying? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's right. You know, in the village of Mamarnik, uh, a couple of things that we have done, we just to toot our horn a little bit, is that we changed the zoning law so that developers are required, not just encouraged, they're required to put 10% affordable into every new uh, for-profit development. I have introduced uh, an idea that the village of Mamarnik waive building fees for developers who are doing all affordable. Which I think is fantastic. So you see it similar to how I see it, which is that let's incentivize. Yes. And I think that, um, I, I often say, I think you get much farther with the, the carrot than the stick yes. and trying to, to change something. And so I think that's, that's and tremendous. Just, you know, for, for full disclosure, I grew up in uh, all affordable. You know, and not, not public housing, but affordable housing in New York City. And, you know, I've seen the, the positive effect that it can have in a family's life and uh, the, the stability. Right. So, right. you know, I, I think that it's something that government can do, and we really have to step up to the plate. Because the truth of the matter is we're not going to get a lot of help. No. Uh, you know, so this is one where the cavalry is not coming, at least for a while. 
And, uh, for, for a little while. Yeah. I've got some plans for that, <laughs> yeah, but yes, for a little yes, while. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we have to, you know, I always like to say charity begins at home. Yes. So we have to take care of our own here. That's true. And to your point that you said earlier, which is how many people that are working really hard. Working hard. And yet, you know, are really struggling to make ends meet. And I see that all over Westchester. Yep. I see people that are really productive citizens. They're working. You know, it's not... Um, again, I, I think unfortunately from the 80s, you right. know, there was all this talk about, you know, people that were just take, take, take. Oh, it's nonsense. It's, and it, that's not the case. And in Westchester, we, we have a lot of hardworking people that are just, you know, really could need some help. I mean, think of it this way. If, if you're making $60,000 a year, which is not nothing, and you're renting an apartment, a one-bedroom apartment, you're really fortunate if you can get that for two thousand dollars yeah so that's twenty four thousand out of your sixty before you know off the gross right and you know that's before you've paid your taxes <laughs> then you know you like to eat right and, people <laughs> got, <laughs> and if, if you have a kid you know they're gonna need sneakers and shoes you know and pants and right. people don't have anything left over and and the other startling figure is that in Westchester County almost ten percent of Westchester County lives at or below the poverty line yes. and the overwhelming number of what that represents, a lot of um, women and children. Yes. And so... Uh, Single moms. Yeah. And they're, they're working. They're, they're, you know, trying to provide for their families. And, and it's really, really hard. Sometimes working two jobs. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then, or three. You know, or three, yeah. You know, I, I, I so appreciate having someone uh, in office who understands this and who cares about it and is going to work to mitigate it. It, it. It's very important, I think, to this community. So let's talk about an issue that we haven't brought up here, but I think it's going to be very important and I'm very excited about it. You're running for a congressional seat. I am, yeah. Well, congratulations. Uh, I, I, thank I, you. I congratulate you for having the guts to put your name forward. <laughs> well, you know, like you, I'm sure that um, there are a lot of things that we have worked on for years and thought if only we were in federal government where we could really make a real change. And so for the earlier point that you made about affordable housing and the even earlier point that you made about climate change, I see those two ideas as interrelated. Mm -hmm. And if I were in Congress, I would be looking at ways that I can ensure that our, you know, Department of HUD is actually housing and urban development. Yes, right. is incentivizing local municipalities to build more affordable housing, do it with green infrastructure, to encourage working with developers who can do that, have a whole, I mean, I, I see this as really almost like a deployment, like we haven't had since World War II, because I think that this is a huge, huge issue across the nation. Yeah, I agree with you, and I think what's happened, especially since I've been an adult in 1980, I, I, I got more mature as I got older. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it, it is that the pendulum has swung so far to the people with extreme wealth. And we have a government now that seems to be working just for the people with extreme wealth. And you know, the, the people in the middle spectrum and the people in the, in the, in the bottom are, are just relegated to the, the I, I don't care. Yeah, and, it, and I'm hopeful that people wake up and see this because this has been a huge change in my lifetime. Well, you know, look, we have seen where people cannot afford to retire. Right. I mean, again, since 1980, when you think about how far we have moved in this country yeah. and, and to your point about where the wealth has gone to a smaller and smaller and smaller uh, percentage of people and the middle class has struggled more and more and more, and the middle class has been shrinking. shrinking. Yeah. So it's we we are in very challenging times. Healthcare is another issue where, on the local level, you just see it. Uh, you know how people are impacted by, um, you know, all the costs. Even when they're insured, they yes. are still in jeopardy. Out of pocket of, expenses. Out of pocket expenses, are, and for for many people, and again. Um, many senior citizens are really finding that they are making really difficult choices uh, for their well-being. Yeah. On you know, healthcare is really almost a luxury. You know, you see 
you know, and, and I know you, you have uh, an active internet, uh, you know, f uh, social media. You see these, you know, posts where people are raising money to cover their children's health expense. Yeah. And I look at this and I go, what's the matter with us? Yeah. You know, I mean, no other country in the free world would, would put up with this nonsense. No. And as you know, I was a small business owner for almost 23 years. Yes. And, and I, you know, I paid for insurance. Um, I had employees that I needed to take care of. But I also knew some of my neighbors on, you know, our version of Main Street who thought of health care as an extra expense that they couldn't afford. And then when they had, uh, you know, a, a something like cancer and needed treatment, yeah. you know, it was up to all of us who knew, knew the person and felt like, well, we've got to just chip in. And, you know, I was very glad that in 2010 I went on a game show and happened to win $50,000 on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire oh, because really? I was able to give some money to... Uh, one of my neighbors on, on Purchase Street in Rye who had just had a, a diagnosis with cancer right. and, and, you know, was really fearful of how, how was she going to be able to, you know, pay for, it, you know, everything because she, she wasn't insured. And Over 50% of the bankruptcies in this country are caused by people going bankrupt because of health insurance, a, a lack of health insurance. Right. So in this country, if you get sick, there's a good chance you're going to be bankrupt. Rubbed. Yeah, yeah. Everything you work for your whole life. And I, I think that's, you know, that's a point that Elizabeth Warren often makes about the fact that she had been a lawyer for the insurance industry. She always uh, represented the insurance companies against people that were filing for bankruptcy. And her impression before she really got into it was, oh, people were just trying to bilk the system. But then she learned how many people had suffered bankruptcy because uh, to your point yeah. about health insurance and you know having a catastrophic health event which really just un, you know it, it started them on a on a, a path that they could not come back from it, yeah it's just, you know nobody should have to beg uh, for you know their their children's health care you know, that's just to me it's just heartbreaking right and I know you feel the same way and, and you know what, what, what I'm heartened by, listen, you know, people ask me who am I voting for in the primary. Honest to God, don't know yet. I, I, I really don't because I look at it and I say, you know what, at the end, I, I would like to politically go to sleep until June, <laughs> wake up, somebody tells me who the candidate's going to be. And I'm like, okay, let's go. I think a lot of us have yeah. a little bit of fatigue yeah. from the last few years. Yeah. But, uh, but as I always like to remind my friends, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, so you can take a little bit of a rest, and, but, but we need all hands no, on deck I'll, for I'll be this ready to November. Go in June. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very good. I'm, taking, I'm breathing deep now, Catherine. Yes. Um, so, so tell me about the, the, the challenges of running uh, a congressional race. Well, it's interesting. So it's a, Nita Lowy, who I think we've, we all loved, she sure. served the Sound Shore for many, many years before a judge in 2011 made the decision that Mimarinek and Larchmont and Rye were no right. longer in her district. Uh, but she, she did an amazing job for, for Westchester and the Hudson Valley. She was always and there for us. She always was. And as a now head of appropriations, certainly she's been able to um, to control the flow of money and and you know we have this new improved bridge that connects Rockland and Westchester County and that right. was due to, to Nita. Uh, so um, given that she served for 32 years there are a number of us who are elected officials who feel that again out of frustration for what we have done on the local level and seeing that you know maybe if at the federal level we could help our communities right. more I also think that possibly because of what happened in November of 2016 and, uh, you know, the Trump presidency and how some people who weren't necessarily paying that close attention to politics yeah. have, you know, become energized. energized. Yeah. And so when a seat opens, they think, hey, I want to do that. Yeah. And so it was a big field. There are 12 people. Uh, I seem to have... Uh, you know, taking the lane of the environmental candidate. I mean, that is where I've always worked on policy and certainly where I have a pretty well thought out 
um, idea of what we can do at the federal level to help our communities. Uh, but, you know, we'll see how it, how it goes at the end of the day. I only represent currently a very small portion of Nita Lowy's congressional district. But because I was working on a lot of policy for all of yeah. Westchester, I actually have a broader base than just my own district. Right. So, and, and you grew up. Yes, I grew up in the district. Uh, in fact, you know, her district lines have, have moved pretty substantially. Right. So uh, it's only been in the last few years that I haven't actually and been in her district. And they might morph again come 2021. It most definitely will morph again. And where that goes, um, I've had a number of elected officials say to me, well, I hope if you if you win the primary, you don't sell your house in Rye because you may find that Rye ends up getting <laughs> back in, in the district. Yeah, he's but, rented. Yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> it, it, I, I, I wish you luck, and I, I know how hard it is. And I know that there are, you know, a lot of people in the field and a lot of people, uh, you know, who, who want to be crowned. But, you know, you've been in the trenches for a long time. Uh, you know how government works. You know what it takes to actually get something done. And to me, that, that is, you know, a, a great qualification. Because, you know, it, it's easy to talk about, uh, you know, your, your goals and aspirations, but to actually have taken your goals and aspirations and, you know, got them into legislation. And, and as we both know, sometimes, you know, it, the, 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 uh, you have to go with what's good and not what, what's perfect. That's right. It's so interesting that in my 12 years as an elected official, eight of the 12 years, I was in the minority. Right. And I was still able to affect change. Right positive change. And to your point about, you know, perfect is not, you know, don't let perfect be the, the enemy, enemy of, of the good. good. That's what I was searching for. Thank yes. you for finding <laughs> <it> for me. <laughs> um, but so I think that's a real um, skill that I can bring. Yes. Uh, and I think it's important because as everybody's talking about their aspirational goals for what they hope to do if they're in Congress, I think they have to have a plan A for if we have, you know, a change in the White House, a change in the Senate, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you can, you're, you're cooking on all, all burners, for yeah. burners, or you have to plan for plan B, where you really have to work hard to make coalitions and to enable change. To and get I, a majority, yeah. I, I think that I can talk to those, you know, representatives for Kansas farms and Iowa farms and talk about climate change and how it's affecting their constituents and find a way to help us back here. Right, because they have to make uh, allowances. You know, the, we, we, we can't keep working the way we've been working. That's right. You know, we're, we're eating the seed corn, yeah. as they say. You know yes. what I mean? We're not leaving anything. For, but we have to wrap up. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I wish you all the luck in the world in your election. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I, I would be very sad to lose you as a county legislator. But, uh, you know, I know that you would be able to do great things in Washington, D.C. It would be like you would have two Congress people for, for the village. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Catherine, thank you very much. It and was a pleasure. I, I'm sure I'll see you uh, in the next few days somewhere in the village. Absolutely. Thanks thank you. Bye-bye.